50 Bucks, a short story of the Elsewhere in Corporate. It was a time of great excitement for the Kingdom of Newlandia. The people rejoiced across the cities in honor of their new king, His Majesty Pendergast I. While tankards of ale were raised in honor of the young king in bars and pubs across the kingdom, the grandest celebration was in Altrust Castle, where the king was being coronated. The two narrators of the Elsworn Corporate watched in silence as the prince knelt before the priestess. Neither one nor two cared much for the religious passages. Nothing puts the kibosh on theological thinking more than actually meeting a few gods and goddesses. Or devils, for that matter, but that's a tale for another day. As the priestess placed the crown on the prince's head, one said, I have to admit, you did a good job. Two said nothing. He merely stood there with a grin that would unnerve a cat. I guess Teats can't say you never do any work now, huh? One said as he looked through the assembled crowd. Speaking of which, where is our benevolent leader? Two pointed at the front row of the crowd where the elder dreamer sat with his wife, Karma. Both were in fancy dress as befitting a royal ceremony and were among the first to clap when the king sat down on his throne. One and two clapped as well, though one's applause was out of politeness. He had nothing to do with the assignment and didn't know much about the people involved. After a few moments, King Pinderbreast rose to his feet. The clapping rose briefly before it finally died down. Once the room was more or less silent, King Pinderbreast made a great show of clearing his throat. <clears throat> People of Newlandia, he said, his voice booming out across the throne room. Friends, noblemen and women, and visitors from afar, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today. Too long have the people of this fine country suffered under the injustice of King Tagmar. It is with the help of many here in this room that I now stand here, the true king of this land. And as king, I pledge to protect the people of this fine nation, to ease the burden of the poor and destitute, and to open friendly relations with our neighboring countries. No more futile wars, no more excessive taxes, no more intolerance of the beliefs of others. This I promise you on the blood of my father, King Jinder the Just. More applause filled the rooms. As they applauded as well, one said, You know, I read Alan's report. He really is going to usher in a new age of light for these people. All thanks to you. Two smile widened slightly, but he said nothing. When the room quieted down again, the king said, Before we go to the celebratory feast, there is one person I need to thank. He stood by me when my quest seemed impossible. He was there when everyone else had turned on me. He even introduced me to Lady Talmere, my friend and companion through these many adventures. She has taught me much about the strength of women I took for granted for so long, and I am honored and overjoyed to announce that she has agreed to become my queen. Some applause broke out, as well as some light tittering from some of the noble women. The tall, dark-skinned woman in plate mail standing beside the king bowed her head, her cheeks even darker than the rest of her skin, and a happy smile on her face as the king took her armored hand in his. Cute couple, one said, clapping. Not only did you knock out a save the king job, but you even squeezed in a cupid's arrow. Again, two said nothing. There was something disconcerting about his smile. One remembered seeing a similar look in his friend's face before he fell victim to uh, an elaborate practical joke. One still couldn't look at a banana without shuddering. The king continued, That man, that angel who appeared to be in my time of need, is here with us today. James? James? One asked, raising an eyebrow at his buddy. That's my cue. His chest puffed out, two strolled through the throne room, seemingly oblivious to the curious stares of the other guests. Both the king and his future queen were smiling as two approached the throne. Never one for protocol. Two stood a few steps down from the king with his hands in the pockets of his old jeans and waited in patience with the same strange smile on his face. Sir James of Bridges, King Pinderbreast said, I... Nay, this entire country owes you a great debt of gratitude. Gratitude. Tell me, what can I possibly offer to repay you? Still smiling, two said, only what you promised. 
To the surprise of many, the honorable and just king's expression faltered. Uh, I could offer you all the riches you could carry. Artifacts of power long kept safe in this kingdom. Money I don't need, and I'm pretty happy with the power I've already got. I could make you a duke of the kingdom. Uh, I'd rather not get tied down to any one place. I, uh, could speak with my sister. I beg your pardon, said a well-endowed young lady in the front row. Two's eyes rested on her for a moment. Tempting, but I'm afraid I have to decline. All I ask is what you promised me when our adventure started. There are quite a few curious glances coming from the crowd at this point, including those of Teach and Karma. Even Lady Talmere was raising an eyebrow at two. After visibly struggling internally for a few moments, the king finally let out a resigned sigh. I wish to reward you better, but if that is all you desire, I will honor my promise. Two nodded, knelt down, and promptly punched King Prinderbrast the king who would usher in an age of peace and light, squarely in the groin. The king fell to his knees, gasping in pain as two stood back, an amused look on his face. Her face contorting in anger, Lady Talmere took a step forward, only for the king's hands to rise, stopping her. I gave my word, he wheezed before looking at two. Our debt is paid? Yep, I'm done here. Later. As Lady Talmere helped her future husbands arise, Two turned to what was now his audience and approached the still-seated Teach and Karma. Teach crossed his legs as Two came to stand before him. Two, what the hell are you... Two's hand shot out, beckoning. Pay up. Teach stared at Two, dumbfounded, eventually managing to say, What? Remember when you dragged me out to deal with that mad king on Venta? I told you I'd just punch the bastard in the Grundies, and you laughed and told me you'd pay me 50 bucks if I punched any king in the balls and walked away without a problem. Horror dawned in Teach's eyes. That was 300 years ago! Yeah, well, you never put a time limit on it. He offered you all the treasure you could carry, which I declined so that I could take $50 from you. Now, are you going to pay up or not? Teach stared at Two, seemingly lost for words. Two waggled his eyebrows at the Elder Dreamer and rubbed his fingers and thumb together, meaningfully. His face red, Teach grumbled beneath his breath as he fished the wallet out of his, the pocket of his expensive suit. There was definite anger in his eyes as he counted out five ten-dollar bills and laid them in the patiently waiting Two's outstretched palm. Thank you, Two said, his voice cheery as his hand closed around the bunny. Oblivious to the glares of Teach and Karma, the confused looks from the nobles, and the pained, and yet slightly amused look of King Pinderbrast, two walked back to where one was watching in utter amazement. Want to go get something to eat? Two asked brightly as he waved his handful of bills. My treat! Huh, I thought that would take longer. Okay, well, uh, as you probably have already guessed, this is this backtracking. Oddly enough, uh, I had to do this twice, again, because I lost my save. I forgot to save. you think I'd learn at some point. But it worked out for the best, because I had completely forgotten about those uh, the fireballs in that first room, in the last dungeon of this area. Let's see. Most of it's for, uh, most of the backtracking does is worth it. You get, get some good stuff. I think I distinctly remember this one being a waste of time, though. I think it gives you, like, a strange bottle, which... Considering that you had to go to the Leo's lab to get the sword... I don't know. You think they could have put something more valuable there than something I've already had and barely used. Okay, uh... Well, I guess while I'm still doing that, I can go up and talk about the story a bit. Uh, oddly enough, it was going to be its whole whole book at one point. Uh, I, was, I wanted to do a, a book about Two taking on a job. If you're familiar with the Elsewhere Universe, Two is a notorious flake who does everything he can to get out of work. And if, as you heard in the story, even when he does work, there's usually an ulterior motive in it. 
He's never been particularly fond of Teach. Teach, who routinely uh, resorts to, well, let's just say less than ethical means to get the other dreamers to do what he wants. He's not above blackmail. He's not above... Oh, I should probably put the flight the, uh, put the other armor back on. Oddly enough, the elemental mail has no effect here. But, uh... Teach is not above playing with people's emotions to get what he wants. And two hates that. And two went for, I think it was almost the entire run of a narrative number one coming in. Before actually taking a job. His first job was actually to go pick up narrative number one. Oh, I should do that story next. Uh, well, nice surprise you to know that narrative number two was calling himself narrator number two before there was a narrator number one. He used narrator number one as a scapegoat. Like, he'd go around and say, no, no, you're not, I didn't mess up that. I didn't cause the Great Pyramids to fall down. That was one. And I'm number two. I always thought that was a particularly cute refer uh, cute joke to throw in there. Because naturally, if you think of the, the two people named narrator one and two, You'd think the one who was named one was the first. I will say that, uh... There I go again. Uh, <laughs> I will say that his name is actually James. That is, an ac is, is, that is accurate. And to say he's James... And the fact he was called James from Bridges, a typical callback to knights being, you know, getting the name of their town... Well, not necessarily knights, but you know what I mean. Sir James of Bridges. <laughs> uh, Storyline-wise, I will say that... Uh, I don't even know if I'll ever even go back to that particular world. But, it is funny. The uh, I just like the fact that he went to a lot of trouble just to show up to each. And that's two in a nutshell right there. He's a smartass, and he'll do anything to be able to be more of a smartass. I don't know, he has a lot more backstory, too. But, uh, we're going to have to cover that after the uh, Dreamer's Night series. Oh. See, again, you just unlock this guy, and he just tells you something you already know. Give me experience. Give me something. I mean, if you're getting near the end of the game, you can give me a, you can throw levels at me. Okay. Oh yeah, we gotta sneak up on this one. Basically, just get as high as you can on the screen and hit him from the other side. Up. Oh, it was too close. I want to say he's got something important though, so we got we do have to find this guy. Okay. Oh, got him. He has the Red Hawk Mirror. That's the first part of the Phoenix spell we're going to need. Well, it says there's three things you need. Yeah, the Master Emblems, we know. I think I've... I don't think I've got to that yet. There's one, there's one of them I missed. I actually managed to find all of them except for one just going through the game normally. And I, had to, I did have to look up where that last one was. And I will say it was a, somewhere where I never would have expected. Okay. That clears up this area, so I forgot which way I was going from. I think the mountain area, uh, the one with the little uh, people who live like only a year, that was the only place without like backtracking stuff. And even then, you have to backtrack to get the Phoenix Bell. Okay, here I'm looking for. Uh, what am I looking for here? The, uh, the volcano. There's a metal monkey monster in the volcano I need to get to.
when I started doing the short stories, when I started writing them, the idea was a... I've always had trouble with short stories. It's too easy to look at a short story and say, oh, I could turn this into a full novel. And I just don't have the time to keep making novels, and sometimes it's not necessary. You don't really need to hear the whole story of uh, King Prenderburst. Prenderburst. Or Lady Talmere. Just to, uh, to get what that story's about. It's not, this, it's not even really about them. It's about teaching, too. Just like, uh, what was the other one I did? Chicken Wing. Uh, no, Wings of Freedom. That's what it was. It was sort of a lesson that a dreamer helping somebody does not necessarily mean that person is a good person. And just because they seem to be helping you doesn't mean they are necessarily actually helping you. The Elsewhere is supposed to have sort of a mysterious air like that. Okay, that is the only thing here. I don't think I did it here. I think it was the first, was the first recording, which means I didn't have to waste anyone's time on it. But I think the first time I came to the seabed, I had to search all around because I was so sure there was another metal monkey. Yeah, I'm still doing it. Dang it. Oh, no, okay. I was just checking for monster layers. Okay. By this point in the game, you're just cleaning up. Going through and getting the last few things. But yeah, Wings of Freedom... Well, I, already, I guess I just explained that. Got some more short stories. Uh, I'm sure we'll run into other instances in the future where I have to backtrack or... do something that doesn't really... doesn't require much commentary. I wish it was a bit longer. I, I find myself, again, kind of just watching. So strange to play through this again. The not, not too bad, because even when you play through again, sometimes when you bring you, sometimes when you say, oh, "I want to play this game again," the interest in the game doesn't last until the end. You say, oh, "I've pulled out Mario World a ton, a dozen times. I've only beat it like three or four. It's because you play for a while and you're like, "Okay, I'm done with this." Let's see, it should be everything here. Yeah, I was really searching everything. Be fair, I think this is the last spot, too. This is the, uh... I started with the valley. And I've been moving this way. There's nothing in the mountain. By the time we got to Dr. Leo, we had the metal sword. And the spook sword was only for, the, like, the castle. And those two things, those two enemy bases in the forest. Okay up here. Oh, I'm checking the, um... Oh, that's right, the lightning tower. No, I, I didn't need to do it here. But depending on how patient you are uh, as a player, you may have to come back at this point. I remember there are metal monkeys here. You can kill them by luring them over to one of the lightning rods. But if you don't realize that, or if you just don't want to bother doing it, You'd have to come back later to take them out. Me, I just kind of wanted to clear them out as fast as possible. Yeah, see, they're all the way over here, and you have to walk them all the way over to the lightning. But I can see people just being like, I don't have time for that. I'm pretty sure they didn't unlock anything important anyway. Let's see, just old news. It's a good thing about all these gems, though. It's nice to you can get back real fast. Okay, and this mermaid has... Red Hot Steak. Okay, that means we have one more piece we need. And I think it might actually be in the last level. Other than that, we're going to need the... Um... Yeah, oddly enough, if the Phoenix isn't enough, you also need the last armor and uh, last weapon. Okay, did, uh... 
again, since I have, these are pre-recorded, I have to guess what I was thinking at the time. I think I'm trying to see if there's anything here. Let's see. Oh, I remember. This is the uh, the last master emblem. Never would have found it without the, the guide. There's no indication you can push these things. But, you can push this one. And there's the last emblem. Now we can go to the forest and get uh, the magic bell, I think is what it's called. Let's see, moving back to the forest. It's been kind of nostalgic about getting to this, like, to the end of the game and going through old areas. The first film that ever gave me a serious sense of nostalgia was Land Before Time, the original one. Just even as a kid, I get like you get to the end of that movie and it just it shows like the flashback. So everything bit they well, almost everything they went through. Oh, did I not? Oh, I'm, I'm still missing part, aren't I? No, I got the magic bill. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and move into position. Okay. Well, it's all the backtracking, so I will see y'all next time. Well, almost all the backtracking, but I'll still see y'all next time anyway.